Today we're going to talk about honeybee genetics. We'll cover the honeybee casts, bees around the world, genetic traits, bee types commonly used in managed colonies, and more. First, let's talk about honeybee casts. Within the hive, there are three casts of honeybees. The worker, a female bee who does all the work within the hive, from foraging for food to guarding the hive, caring for brood, and cleaning. They do everything but lay eggs and mate. Then there's the queen bee, a fully fertile female who lays up to 1,200 or 1,500 eggs a day, and the drone bee, the male bee whose purpose is to mate. The queen bee will go on a mating flight shortly after she emerges from her cell. On this mating flight, she'll fly closer to a mile or so away from the hive in order to find drones that don't belong to her colony. She'll mate with up to 10 or 15, sometimes more drones, and then return where she'll begin to lay eggs a few days later. A queen bee is typically going to go on one mating flight in her entire life. There are documented situations where a queen went on a couple of flights back to back, possibly because she didn't get mated well the first time. And in those cases, obviously, she left the hive a couple of times, but they were concentrated together. The only time she'll leave again is when it's time to swarm and she'll spend the remaining part of her life laying eggs. This is where the honeybee genetics really begins. A queen bee can choose to lay a female or a male egg. A female egg is a fertilized egg that consists of 32 chromosomes where 16 come from the mother and 16 come from the father. A male egg is an unfertilized egg where all the chromosomes come from the queen herself. Before we begin to dig in to the different bees around the world, it's important to realize that beekeeping history is a long one and that humans and bees have had a close relationship since pretty much the beginning of civilization. There are seven to nine species of honeybee. There's 26 subspecies of Apis mellifera and 20,000 bee species worldwide that are consist of non-honeybee species and 4,000 bee species just in North America. I share these numbers primarily to give you an idea of how diverse this family of creatures is. You'll notice there's a little overlap in the types of honeybees and where they live within the world. The Western honeybee is by far the most widespread. You've also got Eastern honeybees, giant honeybees, dwarf honeybees. There's several honeybees here that live in targeted areas of the world. Since bees have grown and evolved in so many different environments around the world, there are actually a variety of genetic traits that you'll see expressed in certain regions and within certain genetic lines. Some of these traits include cleanliness, disease resistance, temperament, production, population, winter hardiness, the amount of propolizing or propolis that they collect, the tongue, tongue length, their preference for flowers, and their body color. Since the queen openly mates with 15 or so drones, it's important to realize that controlling genetics is a very difficult thing to do. So the only way that it can truly be controlled is either in isolated environments like islands or through instrumental insemination. The rest of our genetic traits and queen rearing, if it's openly mated, is typically done just by observation and selection, and then of course, saturating the genetics in a given area to make sure that you're getting the traits that you've decided you're seeking. We're going to review a few of the bee races that are commonly used in managed colonies. You've got the Italian, the Carniolan, the Caucasian, the European dark honeybee, and the African honeybee, and then hybrids of these and a couple of others here that are very common. As I mentioned, because controlling genetics is so difficult, in most cases, you're going to be purchasing a hybrid queen. 
and the exact genetics of that bee are probably going to be unknown. So let's talk about some of these specific breeds so that you can better understand where some of these traits came from throughout the world. We'll start with the Italian or Lagustica. So this is Apis mellifera Lagustica and she originated in the peninsula in Italy. And because this area is almost entirely surrounded by the sea, the race was mostly separated from outside influences and in other races. And so this bee was able to develop pretty unique qualities. This is one of the most widely distributed bees in the world and is a very popular bee in North America. Um, it was introduced in America in 1859 and really quickly replaced the original European black bee or German bee bees that were brought over by the colonists. Um, they were preferred for a lot of reasons, but they were really adapted well to our environment. As we discussed in the last case, the Carniolan bee is nated, native to another isolated region high in the Austrian Alps and Danube Valley regions. So they can be found across large areas of Eastern European, like Hungary, Croatia, Serbia. And because of their colder originations, they do tend to stick into tighter clusters, making them very good overwinter overwintering bees, and they quickly rebound in the spring for the same reason. Then there's the Caucasian bee, which bluntly is not the most popular bee, primarily due to their susceptibility to infections. Um, they also have colonies that reach their full strength midsummer, which can be an undesirable trait for areas that have high spring nectar flows. Um, they are extremely gentle, they are great honey producers, and they have strong winter survival. Next, we have the European dark bee or Apis mellifera mellifera, commonly known as German bees, black bees, or dark bees because of their darker abdomen. And this breed was originally from Northern Europe. They tend to be a little larger than some of the other honeybee breeds. I don't know if you'd be able to notice it, but it, it, is, it is measurable. And they've become mostly out of favor due to defensive behavior and susceptibility to disease, which is why they were mainly replaced by some of the Carniolan and Italian genetics here in the United States. Next, we'll talk about the African Scutellata bee. In America, there was an active effort to stop the genetic spread of Africanized hives migrating from South America. And since I'm focused on pure breeds, I'm not really referring to African hybrids in this particular slide. And there are mixed reviews on whether keeping Africanized genetics is a good or a bad thing. Since most, if not all, commercially available queens are hybrids, knowing this, um, knowing these main four races is really just to help us understand where hybrids like the Buckfast, Cordovans, Russians, and even Africanized bees came from. So in this case, you can see that African bees tend to be more def defensive. They have been shown to actually usurp or take over entire hives. Um, they do have swarming tendencies primarily because they keep smaller colony sizes and they don't overwinter as well as some of the bees that were bred in northern, more northern areas. Genetic diversity in bees is primarily a benefit because it allows the colony to better handle diseases inside the hive. Um, and so that hybrid vigor and genetic diversity remains an important focus for both queen breeders, biologists, um, and, and bee scientists. Um, changing the queen does effectively change the hive. So understanding that you can change the entire genetics within the hive in about 30 to 40 days is a really good thing to know about beekeeping because you can always change um, the genetics and or the traits that are, are showing up in your hive through that queen change. Just realize it's not gonna happen immediately. And then lastly, once you start to get to know working your bees, you can begin to select more desirable traits that work for you, for your area, um, and you know, just for your management style. So realize that you're not married to one particular breed 
for the rest of your life. You can decide what works best for you. And that's it for this overview of bee genetics. Obviously, there is a lot more to learn about bee genetics, um, but this is a good start so that you can better understand what questions you want to be asking or dig into specific honeybee races or the process of breeding itself. So thank you so much for watching along and we'll see you next time.